of challenge distills one of the kind of statistical um, uh, sort of questions in the federated setting. Um, so, you know, in these data sets where you have a large number of maybe heterogeneous uh, users or data sources that each contribute a very little amount of data. Um, you know, one question is how do you learn kind of the population of underlying models and parameters? Um, there's also the question of how do you then use this kind of knowledge of the population of models to improve each user's model? Um, but that's maybe a, a se slightly separate question. Okay, so the big meta question here is in this federated setting, can the large number of data sources compensate for lack of data from each source? And you know, if so, can we quantify this? Okay, so um, I'm gonna kind of present the results in this um, sort of setting of trying to understand the um, kind of sex ratio, um, but obviously the results will apply more generally. Okay, so think of the following kind of very clean model for this. Suppose we have N people in our population. Each person has um, kind of a hidden coin and the ith person has a coin with a bias of P sub I. We observe T tosses of each coin. And, um, and you know, suppose our goal is to estimate the set of PIs or you can think of it as we want to estimate kind of the, the distribution of the PIs or, or the, the histogram of the P sub I's. Um, okay, so just you know, starting with the absolute basics, if you just look at the empirical um, estimates of the PIs, um, well, if we toss each coin T times, the error in each of the PIs is gonna be roughly one over square root T. And the question is, can we hope to do better than this? So I want to begin by just illustrating that, you know, we actually should be optimistic that maybe we can do better. So suppose T equals two. So we flip each coin exactly twice. And suppose we observe the following. So, so suppose that this is the histogram of the empirical um, probabilities of flipping heads. So namely, you know, roughly a quarter of the people flip um, uh, uh, you know, two tails. Roughly half the people flip either heads and a tail or a tail and a head. And the other quarter of the people flip two heads. So based on this, um, you know, what can we conclude about the, uh, you know, about the true set or the, the, the distribution of the PIs. Um, okay, so, you know, first of all, because, you know, because if N is big, um, we understand that, you know, the average uh, should concentrate. So we can certainly say, well, you know, with good probability, the average PI is probably close to a half. Okay, um, but I claim that we can actually say a lot more than that. So in this case, I claim that we can conclude that almost all of the PIs must be almost exactly a half. So not only is the average PI close to a half, but actually, you know, if N is large, um, then, you know, uh, probably 99% of the uh, PIs should be between, you know, 0.49 and 0.54. Um, and, you know, why is this? Well, um, so first of all, if all of the PIs were exactly a half, we would expect to see this, right? We'd expect to see that, you know, a quarter of the people flip two tails, a quarter flip two heads, and the rest flip a head and tail and tail and head. Um, but it's not too hard to, um, to kind of work, work out the following. If there was a significant variance in the underlying set of PIs, then you would um, either see uh, empirical distribution where the mean either wasn't close to a half or if the mean was a half, you'd expect to see even more variance than what we observe. So yes, this empirical uh, observations, there is a big variance in what we see, but that's actually the smallest variance that's realizable in this setting. And you know, this is kind of why based on seeing this empirical thing, we can robustly kind of denoise it and come up with this um, conclusion. Okay, I guess a different way of saying this is, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if a significant fraction of the PIs were not between you know, 0.48 and 0.52, we would expect to see something different than what we saw. Um, okay, so obviously this is a slightly cherry picked example. So at this point you should be wondering, well, um, you know, if uh, the true distribution was something else, to what extent can we hope to recover it from the empirical thing? 
right? So this is almost too good to be true. I'm saying we flip each coin twice and we can very accurately uh, recover um, essentially almost all of the PIs. Um, and again, the reason this, uh, well, um, you know, one of the reasons this is a little surprising is you know, all of these different people's data is independent. And yet we're using these um, you know, independent pieces of data to improve our estimates of each of the PIs, right? Um, so it's a bit, it, it's slightly freaky in the sense of, um, you know, so look at this P1, they flip two heads. And yet based on, um, you know, based on this kind of analysis, we are saying, if you were told, what do you think P1's probability of uh, flipping heads is? You'd say, well, based on this analysis, almost all of the PIs are probably almost exactly half. Hence, among the people who flip two heads, almost all of their PIs are almost exactly a half. Hence, even though their empirical probability is one, I would be willing to bet that their true probability is close to a half. And this is a bit freaky because, you know, uh, we're doing this based on the data of P2, P3, and so on, which is independent of the data of P1. Um, but this is, this sort of, uh, um, this doesn't violate anything. Uh, yeah, so, so, so things like um, um, uh, Stein's paradox and other sorts of kind of shrinkage uh, estimators also um, have this property that you can improve uh, estimates, even kind of leveraging uh, independent data. Okay, and if you have questions on this, please do, uh, please do ask. Okay, so the question, uh, so, so this kind of motivates um, the possibility of maybe doing much better and, uh, than just empirical. And the question is kind of what's, uh, yeah, to what extent is this phenomenon general? Okay, good. So, so what are we actually trying to do? Um, so suppose our goal is to return an approximation of the set, or you can think of it as a distribution of the PIs. Uh, we want to return an approximation to this set such that the kind of cumulative density functions are close in an L1 sense. Um, in a, it, you know, uh, phrased differently, the probability density functions are close in, um, in an earth mover sense. So suppose this is the true histogram of the PIs. And suppose you know, each coin we toss 10 times, and this is the empirical, uh, you know, this is the histogram of the empirical PIs. So again, this is spiky because you know, if we flip each coin 10 times, all of the empirical estimates will be multiples of 0.1. And the question is, how do we go from this empirical thing back to an estimate of the true underlying set. And you know, how do we measure the difference between the true thing, the yellow, and the recovered thing, the red? Well, I'm saying we, we should do this in terms of the L1 distance between uh, cumulative density functions or earth mover distance in this uh, probability density function space. So this plot on the right is a cumulative density functions. The blue thing is the empirical. Uh, plot and again everything is the staircase um, has increments at the multiples of 0.1 and the true um, set corresponds to this yellow curve and this recovered thing uh, is this red curve and we're saying we want the red and the yellow curve to be close in an L1 sense um, and that's kind of the most natural metric for, um, for this. Okay, so, um, so you know, how accurately should we hope to do this? Um, so, th so this problem actually was, uh, yeah, has been considered for a while. So it was first considered by um, Frederick Lord, um, who raised this question in the sort of setting of psychological testing. Um, so, you know, in, in his setting, um, you have a bunch of people, each people, each person has a PI which corresponds to the probability that they're gonna answer a given question on a standardized test correctly. And um, you, know, you, you don't just want to estimate the empirical PIs, you actually want to understand what's the underlying distribution over these PIs um, kind of get, if you were to get rid of the noise in, in testing. Um, so anyway, so he had some papers on this that uh, you know, the results were kind of, uh, um, not quantitative in the sense that 
that we would like. Um, but you know, they had a big influence on, um, well, so he worked for the uh, edu educational testing services and this research helped shape, you know, the SATs and GREs and all these uh, you know, modern, uh, uh, modern standardized tests. Okay, so, um, so our first theorem is um, as long as the number of people is very large compared to the number of tosses of each coin, a more than exponential, then you can actually hope to learn this set of PIs to, um, to this uh, you know, L1 distance be between the CDFs of error one over T. Um, so again, in comparison, if you just use empirical estimates, you get error one over square root T. And so here we come doing quadratically better than the empirical. Um, and you know, the proof of this is actually very, very simple. Um, so it basically comes from the fact that if you have lots of people, you can accurately recover um, the first T moments of this set of PIs. Namely, you can estimate the mean of the PIs, you can estimate the, um, you know, the mean of the squares of the PIs, the mean of the cubes of the PIs, all the way up to the mean of the teeth powers of the PIs. And then the second portion of the proof is just um, arguing that, well, given accurate estimates of these first T moments, you can, you can um, uh, um, return an accurate estimate of the distribution. So if you have you know, two bounded distributions over the reals, so in our case, these are distributions over probabilities, distributions over the interval zero one. If the first T moments match, then the distance between these distributions is um, uh, one over T. Um, and again, the kind of complication is, well, um, in order to accurately estimate the first T moments, you do need, uh, you, know, you do need N, the number of people to be large, so at least exponential. And the question is kind of what happens if you have say less than an exponential number of people compared to the amount of data from each person. Um, okay, so if we just have a constant number of people say there's just one person, then all you can hope to do is return the empirical estimate and you get this error of one over square root T. With lots of people, we get this error of one over T. And one question is how do you kind of interpolate between these, um, th th these error rates as the number of people uh, you know, goes from constant to exponential? Um, so in this more recent work um, <clears throat> from last year, we showed that actually one does get this kind of smooth interpolation. So as n goes from being um, <clears throat> so polynomial to exponential, you do get this, this kind of smooth uh, transition. Um, and we actually conjecture that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we conjecture that um, uh, this result kind of actually holds all the way down to the constant regime, but, um, uh, but we weren't able to, to show it. Um, and, you know, the, the algorithm here sort of corresponds to, um, uh, it corresponds to this kind of likelihood, uh, you know, maximum likelihood estimation um, problem in the following sense. So it corresponds to asking, find me a distribution or an unordered set of PIs such that if the PIs are drawn independently from this distribution, then we maximize the likelihood of observing the set of statistics that we do observe. Um, so, right, so, 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 that, so this, you know, it sounds like it might be a complicated um, optimization problem. Some different versions of this problem end up being, um, you know, seeming to be sort of uh, um, maybe NP hard, but in this case, it's actually con computationally tractable, tractable. It is a convex uh, optimization problem. Um, let, let me skip the sketch of the proof of this, this result. So it basically looks sort of like the old proof, but now instead of going via moments, it goes, it goes through these sort of, uh, um, sort of moments, but with respect to Bernstein polynomials. Um, yeah, let's skip this part. Um, okay. Um, let me very quickly discuss some of the empirical, uh, Results. So, um, so 
even the moment matching algorithm um, does work um, quite well in practice. So here are three different kind of synthetic settings where the, um, this is the CDF. Um, so here the um, green is the ground truth CDF. So in the case of a uniform distribution over zero one, the CDF is just a straight line. If we flip each coin 10 times, we get this empirical staircase thing corresponding to the red curve. And you apply our machinery and you recover something that's very close to the, the truth. The second thing, um, the true distribution is just three spikes. One at, I guess, a third, one at a half, one at two thirds. Um, and you know, in all these cases, we're kind of recovering the good approximation of the truth despite the empirical um, distribution of the PIs being uh, quite, quite off. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a real world example. So the, the students involved in this were keen on basketball. So um, you know, suppose we think of um, P sub I as the um, probability that some given basketball player um, will make each of their three-point basketball attempts in a given game, in the ith game of the season. So, um, actually, I'm sorry, this isn't, uh, sorry, th this corresponds to maybe 500 games ending in the 2016 or 2017 season, sorry. Um, and so the red thing is the empirical game-to-game -game shooting percentage of Steph Curry. This red curve is a game-to-game -game shooting percentage of uh, Danny Green, the CDF of it. And if you apply our machinery, you end up recovering that the true underlying set of PIs for Steph Curry is probably close to this spike, basically at you know, 0.45, which corresponds to saying that you know, almost every game, uh, you know, he's, you know, each three-point attempt is going to go in basically independently with probability 0.45. In the case of Danny Green, even after this kind of denoising, you end up with this um, CDF that still has a significant variance. Okay. Um, um, and you know, I guess one of the use cases of this sort of thing is that you can now use this recovered PIs as a as a prior. Um, so uh, you know if. You know, based on some data from a current game, suppose it's halftime and Green has made zero to four shots so far, you could say, well, what's the probability he'll make this next shot? And you know, taking the zero for four um, you know, data, you can say, well, based on the prior given by this blue thing, what do you think his PI is? And the answer would be, well, it's probably close to this 0.2, maybe he shouldn't shoot anymore. Whereas in the case for Steph Curry, if you do this kind of uh, empirical base sort of sort of thing, you'd end up with um, the conclusion that, yeah, the probability he'll make his next thing is, you know, 0.4 something, he should keep shooting. Um, okay, I was also trying to, you know, I was also curious, I did want to try to um, come back to the offspring sex ratios. Um, it's pretty hard to understand in humans. Um, I think in there's part, one question in, oh, in the chat. Yeah. I'm just trying to unmute something. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, so the I question. Can I ask a question? Oh, is it possible? Please go ahead and ask. Okay, question. thank you. So, yeah, so um, can you please describe what are practical theoretical studies of using uh, chiral divergence versus uh, one to perform non parametric distribution estimation? Because uh, from practical point of view, when I faced with such task uh, about uh, distribution estimation, I used uh, a KL divergence principle. Uh, oh. So does it affect bounds uh, of algorithms or it does not, it doesn't matter? Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so, so I guess in, in this case, um, we were talking about, a, um, you know, estimating this, um, you know, it's a distribution of probabilities, but so it's just a distribution over the interval zero one. Um, and, you know, so, so there, um, you know, imagine, imagine just a point mass at probability 0. 0.5 versus a point mass at probability 0. 0.4999. Uh, 
So these two distributions, um, I mean, they actually have L1 distance, you know, they have uh, uh, their, their L1 distance is, um, uh, um, you, you know, is, is one. Um, and in this case, it's actually the, you know, the earth mover distance that you'd care about, which is the L1 distance between the CDFs, right? So um, uh, just going back to the, um, yeah, just, just going back to this plot, right? So, so, you know, here, like, you know, these two spikes are close together. So um, the earth mover distance here is small, even though the L1 distance is big, um, but you can convert from L1 distance in the, um, uh, in the CDF space to earth mover in the original space. And, and again, if you think about, um, you know, what would happen if you were to use KL divergence instead, um, you know, it would also be kind of infinite if you kind of are, uh, uh, if you have spikes that are separated by a bit. So in this case where you're trying to recover, you know, distributions over this interval zero one, um, you know, I think this is kind of almost the only metric that really makes sense. It certainly seems like the most natural metric. Um, of course, with, yeah, with KL divergence, you always have these issues of, uh, you know, if the supports don't match up, then you end up with, you know, infinite divergence and it's uh, problematic. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, is that, is that, is that okay? Yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, Good, right. So, so understanding this distribution of PIs is hard um, in part because of lack of independence and um, also, you know, uh, with things like IVF where people can sort of choose the sex of, uh, of their offspring. Um, um, it's much easier to study in dogs. Um, uh, and there's nice data on dogs and typically dogs don't get IVF. Um, so, um, you know, and in dogs, you know, each litter of dogs is typically, you know, four to eight puppies, which means you can hope to reliably estimate four to eight moments, which should be enough to get, um, you know, to recover some nice properties of the underlying distribution. Um, so it's, it's surprisingly hard to get uh, data from kennel clubs, but um, the Norwegian Kennel Club did, did share their data. So this is a histogram of um, the sex ratio um, empirical probabilities across 20,000 litters. So every single litter produces one data point. And, you know, there's a spike at a half year corresponding to, yeah, there were quite a few litters where exactly half of the um, puppies in the litter were male and half were female. There are spikes at, you know, a quarter and, you know, uh, two thirds and these nice clean probabilities. Um, and some, somewhat disappointingly, if you, uh, you know, apply your machinery, you end up Kind of concluding that well, it's consistent with all of the uh, pi, all of the underlying probabilities being exactly a half. Um, although um, yeah, we would need at least a slightly larger data set to resolve variance of say one percent or so. Um, okay, um, so that's it for the first part of the talk. Um, so there's still this kind of nice open question, uh, well, fairly technical open question, but. Um, of what happens in this intermediate regime uh, where the number of data sources is um, you know, moderate in comparison to T. And uh, you know, so we still don't understand this, this regime. Um, um, and also, you know, sort of more complex versions of this question beyond just trying to estimate uh, these probabilities um, you know, are, are also quite, you know, st still so completely open. Oh, sorry, Greg, we have uh, another question from Imeri, uh, or twice on mute. Please yes. go ahead. Uh, yes, so, so the question is, uh, it's not necessarily very clear in the chat, but I was wondering, I mean, the, the, the bounds you provide on the quantity of, uh, of points that you need are completely independent of the true distribution. Yes. Yeah. I had the feeling that somehow intuitively I mean, it would be easier to recover the distribution when, for example, like all the PIs are one half because it's kind of like um, for every of the individuals, the variance of the number of boys and girls would be maximal somehow. So do you think there's a chance to adapt or, or have I missed something? 
Um, yeah, no, okay, so this is perfect actually. So um, if you take the, the moment-based uh, approach, yeah. so, so very concretely, if you flip each coin once, you can estimate the mean. Yeah. If you flip each coin twice, you can estimate the mean and the variance. Yes. So, what does that, so what does that mean? So that means that suppose the true distribution corresponds to just a spike somewhere. All of the PIs are 0.6. Then, you know, if you only flip each coin twice, it corresponds to saying, I'm thinking of a distribution. The average dis of the distribution is 0.6. The variance is zero. And at that point, you say, OK, stop. I know what the distribution is. It's a spike at 0.6. Yes. Um, and so similarly, you know, there are distributions where, you know, if I tell you the first three moments, the mean, the variance, and the you know, expected uh, cube of the PIs, at that point, you'll say, ooh, ooh, ooh I, I really know the distribution. There's only like one small kind of set of distributions that this can correspond to. Um, so, so in that very concrete sense, um, if by structure you mean um, the distribution is kind of robustly determined by low order moments, yeah. then, then yes, one can do better than this bound. Um, and can you, I mean, how, how do you quantify? I mean, is there a way to quantify that the fact um, that the distribution can be recovered by low order moments? I mean, um, so in terms of like general results saying these distributions will be, these won't be, um, I'm not aware of those. Uh -huh. However, if you tell me the moments, um, you know, b basically the way the, um, the way the, um, uh, this moment inverse problem is solved, you basically solve a, um, uh, um, you basically solve a linear program that says try to match the moments and among the, the distributions matching the moments, you know, uh, give me the range of distributions you can get. So, okay. so if you're given the moments, you can actually get like a lower bound on the CDF as well as an upper bound on the CDF. And you know that the true distribution should lie between those two. So okay. on kind of, for a given instance, you can tell what you know and what you don't know. Um, although, um, yeah, I'm not aware of kind of general sort of theoretical sort of, uh, uh, results. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a really good question. Um, I, I guess that's also why, uh, in this case of the dogs, um, you know, in some sense, like <laughs> we only really needed, uh, litters of size two because the variance seemed to be so small. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, I'll change gears, and the second part of the talk will be maybe very, very short. I just want to give you sort of the uh, the problem, maybe may, maybe the results, and I'll talk a bit about what's happened uh, since since then. So this is um, joint work with uh, Ming Zhe Chao. Um, okay. So in this federated setting, um, you know, given that we will likely aggregate data between users. Um, What's the vulnerability to, you know, say some users uh, maliciously contributing data? So, um, you know, I, you guys probably know better than me in the actual practical setting. But you know, what fraction of like uh, people using Apple phones would need to, um, you know, have some like, you know, we need to type some some sort of profanity in a certain way in such, you know, such that like everybody gets this profanity popping up on their phone in their auto suggest. Okay, so I'm sure they have some safeguards against this, but um, uh, you know, this is sort of a natural question. And let me, let, let me give you a, um, a sort of fairly clean so sort of statistical formulation of this. So suppose we have M data sources um, and a one minus epsilon fraction of them are going to all give us, say, at least k independent samples from some discretely supported distribution d. And we make no assumptions about the remaining epsilon m data sources. So they'll give us some data, but it could be some, you know, adversarial, uh, you know, garbage that's trying to mislead us. And our goal is just to learn this underlying distribution d. Okay, so think about this as, uh, you know, d is the distribution of the next word given you know, given the first three words of our text message. And, you know, suppose in a simple case that, yeah, one minus epsilon fraction of people, you know, they, they honestly are giving you, uh, you know, the K independent samples of this next word. 
and other people are trying to do something to make us not be able to learn this distribution. Um, you can also think of a relaxed version where maybe the one minus epsilon fraction of good people, you know, they don't give you independent samples from this exact distribution, but they give you independent samples from some distribution that's kind of close to this true distribution. So this is kind of reflecting the heterogeneity of users. But let's forget about the second problem for the time being. Okay, and again, think of M, the total number of users as very large, K, the amount of data from each user um, as being modest. Okay, uh, I probably don't need to tell you guys about uh, you know this kind of larger, uh, larger theme of kind of reliable, robust, secure learning. You probably know it better than I do. Um, okay. Um, okay, so the first claim is if k equals one, if each person provides a single data point, then you know no matter how many, um, uh, sorry, this n should be m, no matter how many data um, sources we have, you can't hope to learn this distribution to error better than epsilon plus, I guess, gamma, where gamma is this, um, uh, so the distance of the good people to D. So the question is, as the batch size increases, as we get more data from each person, how, can we, how, how does this change? And the theorem is actually that um, this, uh, the power of the adversaries, of this epsilon fraction of adversaries decreases, um, you know, uh, by you know, a factor of one over square root of k, where k is the number, amount of data from each person. Okay, so the batch size um, it can help. And this is true even though, even when say k is two, even when the batches are so small that there's no way of telling the good people from the bad people. Okay, so in the case where k is two, um, you know, there's no way of saying, oh, you are one of these bad people giving us bad data. But despite the fact that we can't tell who's good and bad, we are able to get a, you know, um, learn the underlying distribution um, that kind of uh, with this um, square root two factor kind of more accurately than if we um, didn't have these batches. Um, okay, so um, algorithmically, um, the runtime of our algorithm is, is uh, so we, we have two different algorithms. The runtimes of both of them are bad. One of them is exponential in, in the number of people. Sorry, again, this N should be M. The other is exponential in K, um, the amount of the, the batch size. So both of these are kind of practically uh, you know, infeasible to run. Um, but um, you know, this information theoretic result uh, is still there. Um, Okay, and just to, just to kind of very quickly sketch out what's happening. Suppose that the underlying distribution is this distri distribution over whatever, a bunch of different uh, um, words. P1 is the probability of word one appearing, uh, you know, P2 is the probability of word two appearing and so on. If we have a batch of size K, then um, you, yeah, we can think of the, distribution of what we see as being this kind of um, uh, this sort of k-wise tensorization of this distribution. Um, so you can think of this as a distribution over k-tuples, but crucially this will be a rank one tensor. And um, the intuition behind the square root k improvement is the fact that if you have two different distributions whose distance is epsilon, then their k-wise kind of tensorization of these distributions have distance epsilon times square root k, or distance at least epsilon times square root k. Um, right, I guess a different way of thinking about this is if you have some adversary that wants to trick you into outputting a distribution q, um, that has distance delta from the true distribution P, then it needs to fill out the kind of corners of this um, tensor to make it rank one. And it'll need to waste an extra square root K sort of uh, data to fill this out. That's kind of the intuition. Um, okay, um, let me skip a discussion of computationally why this is kind of hard and why we were pretty happy with our results. 
Um, um, and let me just mention, so there, there were these two papers from this past, uh, uh, from this past summer um, that were also thinking about this uh, same problem. Um, so, um, and so, so both of these papers, um, um, yeah, sort of analyzed this problem that we were proposing and gave more efficient algorithms computationally, but that lost, um, uh, that lost this like square root log one over epsilon factor. And both of these, both of these papers um, uh, end up formulating the problem as a sort of semi-definite program of uh, sort of relaxation of something and then round the semi-definite program. Um, and that's kind of a sort of standard approach of, well, uh, sort of a standard approach, but needs some tricks to make it work out in this setting. Um, so the question of whether you can actually get this like epsilon over square root k in completely polynomial time is still uh, is still open. Um, okay, and also both of these algorithms, I don't think you can actually run these. Um, so a practical algorithm that would do this is also very much uh, uh, would be very interesting. Um, Okay, so I've been going for about 41 minutes. Uh, should, I, should I talk for another three minutes and then maybe conclude? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I think we all wanna hear about like the last topic just briefly, okay. so. Yeah. Um, okay, um, good. So the this last topic, um, this may be the, uh, um, in some sense, the broadest. Um, and so this is joint work with Justin Chen, who just started his PhD at MIT, um, and, uh, and Paul Valiant. Um, so stepping back a little bit. So, so the question here is, um, you know, how can we make reliable uh, statistical um, estimates or, or you know, reliably learn functions about a population given somehow a flawed, uh, flawed data collection process? Um, so let me sort of plant two, set, two flags in the sand. So the first flag is, um, you know, the typical world of statistical uh, estimation, where typically you make strong distributional assumptions about the data values. Maybe they're drawn from Gaussian, they're drawn independently from something, or maybe exchangeable or so on. The robust statistics literature um, deviates a little bit from this, but it says, okay, 90% of the uh, data points will be drawn from a nice distribution, and then the remaining ones we, re we remove the assumptions on. But um, still, the, um, there are strong distributional assumptions about most of the data points. Um, so this can do framework that I want to propose um, tries to avoid making distributional assumptions about the data, and instead we're going to try to leverage some understanding of the data collection process. So let me describe the framework. So imagine we have n entities. Each one has some hidden value, xi. And for simplicity, think of this as just, uh, say it's just a bounded real number. So for example, say we're gonna do some political survey, we have a thousand people, xi is uh, the actual vote of the ith person. And to begin with, you know, suppose our goal is just to estimate the mean of all of these n values. Okay, so crucially, suppose we know some distribution over subsets of these one through n. And a subset is uh, of these users, uh, sorry, of these uh, yeah, entities is drawn according to this distribution. We observe the people in the subset. We observe the data values indexed by these people. Um, and then based on this, we're going to try to make our estimate. So like in a, you know, in, a, in a kind of simple example, suppose this distribution corresponds to kind of the important sampling setting where maybe the first half of the people independently contribute uh, their data with probably 0.1 and the second half uh, you know, are independently in our sample set with probably 0.5. And um, so in this setting, I guess we are suggesting looking at this worst case expected error where the worst case is with respect to the data values. And the expectation is with respect to this um, sampling process. So we're looking at the worst case expected error um, of estimating 
say the overall mean. Um, and again, the estimate is some function of the distribution P, the set, set of people sampled S, as well as the data values indexed by them. Um, okay. And you know, in this important sampling setting, like you know, good standard estimators do take P into account, right? So the standard estimator here would be you upweight the contributions of the uh, first half of the people. And you know, in this setting, there are, I guess, maybe two main tasks. One is given an estimator. How do you estimate this worst case expected error? How do you actually figure out like how good it is? And the second kind of more difficult task is how do you find the best estimator for a given distribution P? So again, best in this worst case expected error sense. Um, Okay, so obviously um, there are lots of different kind of distributions P that you might want to tackle. One of these is this important sampling setting where different people contribute with different probabilities. Um, and then there are also lots of other more complicated sampling processes, things like, you know, uh, set where your samples are generated according to some say viral process on a social network. Um, or sampling where there's some chronological dependence too. Um, I won't talk about this last thing. But, um, okay, so our main results are so some efficient approximation algorithms for both of these tasks. Uh, let me not talk about this. Um, um, in experiments, our kind of algorithms end up doing very well compared to uh, so standard estimators, um, which was a bit surprising. So even in just an important sampling setting. Um, if you look at this worst case expected error in, of our algorithm in comparison to kind of the two standard reweighting techniques, um, we end up doing quite a bit better, basically because for each of these standard estimators, there is a bad underlying set of data that would make this, um, the standard estimators uh, kind of have, have uh, big, uh, big variance. Um, okay. So I know I kind of went through this last section very quickly. Um, uh, and that's fine. I just wanted to get the, this kind of framework of the worst case expected error out there. Um, okay. okay, maybe I'll just end, I'll just end with this. Um, um, I guess for all three of these, um, so fairly clean, uh, so statistical questions that I mentioned, you know, these are distillations of different aspects of the sort of challenges of federated learning or the, the kind of statistical or kind of learning theoretic challenges of the federated uh, learning setting. Um, and there really seems to be this like whole world of very clean, seemingly, you know, fundamental kind of statistical questions. Um, and many of them are like largely untouched. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot more to be done. Um, so if there are any kind of early stage PhD students out there, I think this is very fertile, uh, er, you know, fertile territory to look. Um, so thank you. Thank you as well. Um, I wanted to maybe um, leave sort of the floor open for questions in case there are still people who would like to ask something. I don't see any hands raised, but we did have a couple of questions during the talk. I mean, uh, Frankly, it was, I, I would be curious to kind of just see like a, a sh like a short snapshot of how the, this last algorithm looks like. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, okay. So, so the algorithm actually ends up, it, it, it's, a, it's, um, So the algorithm ends up being some um, sort of fairly messy semi-definite program, but let mm -hmm. me let me sketch where it comes from. So, um, um, okay. So think of the following setting, which is sort of a yeah, it's a very concrete um, um, yeah uh, yeah. It, it, so very concrete setting. So suppose um, this distribution is the following. So you're given an n node graph. Um, we're going to pick a uniformly random edge. I'm going to tell you the data value at, sitting at one endpoint of that edge. 
And your goal is to predict the data value sitting on the other endpoint of the edge. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and further, suppose that your estimator is going to be kind of the trivial thing, where you just predict that the two endpoints have the same value. Okay. What's the worst case expected error of this estimator? So suppose, suppose the, the values are just binary votes. Um, so what's the worst case expected error of this estimator? Um, well, if you think about it for a little bit, um, the worst case expected error is exactly the um, ratio of the size of the maximum cut in the graph over the number of edges. Namely, if this is your estimator and an adversary gets to put the data values at the nodes of the graph, they're going to put them in such a way that a mm -hmm. random edge maximizes right. the likelihood of having different labeled endpoints, which is exactly the max cut problem. And so even for this very simple sort of uh, instance of our question, um, you know, even evaluating the worst case expected error of this very simple estimation algorithm, you know, is equivalent to um, you know, estimating max cut. Um, so you know, this is NP hard in general, um, but there's efficient approximation algorithms. Um, so via this Gorman's Williamson uh, STP. Um, and it turns out that this sort of general version of our, of our problem can be formulated as a more general version of max cut, which sort of turns into this, um, uh, th this kind of SD, um, uh, semi-definite growth and decrease problem. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is evaluating the quality of an estimator. In terms of finding the best estimator, there's some convex duality tricks we can do to kind of make it essentially the same uh, difficulty. So, mm -hmm. so um, one can kind of, instead of saying, find me the best estimator, you can kind of switch the order of things and tuck that inside and end up using a very similar SDP to find the best estimator. Um, so that's sort of that's sort of what the algorithm is doing. Um, and um, yeah, and that's thanks. Where I mean, the pi over two comes from. Yeah, yeah th thanks. I, this actually gives a pretty good overview. Uh, at least, at least I, I feel like I understood something. So thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's <laughs> that's a goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, okay. So I guess the two over pi, uh, there's someone who's asking this in the in the chat. The two over pi is just the approximation ratio of this standard SDP relaxation. Yeah, so this is uh, the two over pi is, um, um, uh, it's exactly the approximation ratio in this kind of general uh, SDP growth and geek problem. Um, and you know, e even for this specific, you know, even for estimating the quality of the best uh, even for estimating the quality of a given uh, um, estimator f, this pi over two is is um, is tight in the sense that it's NP hard to do better. Um, mm -hmm. um, um, All right. So, yeah. Although, um, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, is it? Hello. Do you hear me? Yep. Uh, I, I had a question about the first part you were presenting on learning population of parameters. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you have shown a method to estimate the distribution of PIs. But uh, the question here is that uh, let's, say, let's assume that uh, we have a given user um, and uh, we use uh, this method to, uh, to, to get the distribution of PI. Can we get an information about the PI that should be used? Um, yeah, so, okay, so, so this is a great question. Um, so, the, so the question is, is yes, so we are sort of, we're, we're, um, we're coming up with the distribution of the PIs, but what, what if we care about a, a single user, right? What if we care about a single sure, sure. PI? Um, so, so this is kind of, this is this point that, um, 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 yeah, suppose, you know, how does knowing this underlying set or population of PIs help? Um, if, if we actually, um, yeah, if we've recovered the set or distribution of PIs, and now would you care about a single PI, you take the data for that PI and you use that together with the set as a kind of prior. 
to, to improve your estimate of that PI. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I um, understand. Okay. That, that's very, thank you very much. Um, and and, and uh, there, there is kind of a question of, well, well, how much does this help? So obviously, like in the case, I mean, in this picture, in the case of, Dan, of uh, Steph Curry, um, his, you know, the distribution of his PIs is basically the spike. So they're, um, you know, using this as a prior, it basically completely resolves what's going on. So in this case, you're kind of denoising a lot. In the case of Danny Green, um, you know, it doesn't help as much. Um, and, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the right, you know, if, you, if you wanted some kind of nice clean theoretical results saying, this is how much it's going to help, it'll obviously depend a lot on what the prior actually is, like what the, uh, um, so, you know, in some cases it'll help a lot. In some cases it won't be as helpful. Um, but um, I think, you know, there is a notion in which this is kind of as good as you could hope to do. Um, but I, 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 I think in that case, we need like to put some, some extra assumptions on how the PIs are. I mean, this is what you call having a, a, a prior on PIs before even seeing the data. I mean, without, without this, we can't, uh, I think without this, we can't at all have any, any, any way to measure how good is the final estimation of PIs we have, right? Yeah. We need yeah. at least some, some extra assumptions on PIs. Otherwise, uh, it can be arbitrary, you see what I mean. You can't use PIs in such a way that, uh, you, I mean, you can always have a mistake. I mean. um, yes, yeah, so I want to say something like, um, it, no matter what the set of PIs is, you'll get at least a constant factor improvement um, versus the empirical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah because, because and I'm not sure what that constant is, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So with that, I think I'd like to thank Greg one last time for a great talk, uh, and uh, see you next week. Well, yeah. Thanks so much, Dan, and thanks. Bye bye. Uh,